moving through that and healing in my own life. Okay, so the tale of two singers, before we get to the tale of, of two kingdoms. Um, so how many of you guys watched the fireworks this week? Yeah? Okay, how many of you guys heard the song, um, you know, Baby, I'm a Firework? Yeah, okay, you did two, three, three of you, four of you? Okay, so does anybody know who sings that song? Katy Perry. Katy Perry. Okay, so Katy Perry, um, I, this, this just like last night, I was like, well, we should talk about Katy Perry because I was telling um, somebody, probably Megan, about Katy Perry. If you did not know, Katy Perry and I are about one month apart in age. We are from the same area of the world, the same area of California, the same county in California, and we both grew up in conservative Christian homes, and we were both singers. So I did not realize this until a long time after she became famous. But I was like, oh my gosh, Katy Perry is that girl? And um, I was a little bit upset about it because, because she wanted to be a singer and a famous singer. And she became famous, yes indeed. And I wanted to become a famous singer also. That was kind of my life ambition for a long time. I was really um, worship, even though I'm not involved in you know this worship ministry here. Worship ministry was like, you know, my heart's passion. And, um, and I, you know, starting when I was, I mean, I was on the radio when I was six. I mean, it was a Spanish radio. And I was with a bunch of other people when we were playing a tambourine and stomping our feet. But I was on the radio. And then um, later on, I was part of the youth band and I was rocking it. And then I did, I uh, went to a youth retreat. And other people at the youth retreat were like, you know, speaking in tongues and passing out, um, you know, full of the spirit or whatever. But me, I started prophetically singing. And then I started prophetically singing at our church. And I was only like 13 or something. Um, a little bit later, I went to, um, I, you know, I went off when I was about 17 or 18. I left home and I did missions work and I was part of a band then. And then I came home and when I came home, the whole church that I went to gathered around me and laid their hands on me and anointed me as the worship leader for that church. And I took that responsibility extremely seriously. Um, I wasn't necessarily the most, per the, you know, the most talented musician. I mean, my husband still gives me crap because sometimes I'm not on beat. Um, but, you know, I, I, I had enough of it musically that I mean, that I was, you know, decent. And I was able to direct the other people on the team. And one thing that I did um, at that, you know, as I was in charge of leading worship at that church is I invested in prayer, which I know at, at this place, we, we value that, right? We value prayer. And um, I figured that I was not the greatest musician ever, but, but God would show up if we prayed. And so we would pray and we would pray. And you know what started happening during worship? I mean, God was showing up in these amazing ways, and people's lives were, I mean, they were being healed, and uh, just hearts were being transformed during the worship time. It, was, it started becoming a very common thing that the pastor would just like be like, whoa, God is here, we're going to change the trajectory, trajectory of the service, and it was, it was kind of cool, you know? The thing is, is that my pastor, though, was a very talented musician himself, and so pretty soon after a while, he started kind of taking over the worship afterwards and I'd be like well, I don't know what to do so I was just kind of backed off in the corner you know or then he would you know he would do you know he would kind of keep taking over and taking over and then one day he showed up at practice and I wasn't going to be like oh pastor you're not supposed to be here go away you know like and so you know he, he was like we're going to do this this week and so he started becoming the main worship leader in addition to being the pastor and that didn't function very well because he didn't have time to be the worship leader and the pastor. He only had time for one or the other. And that kind of became a negative thing because as he was, as he was leading worship, um, you know, he wasn't investing that time into prayer. He wasn't having the team invest that time into prayer. And so things started going like, you know, went from being like, wow, look at God moving to being like, you know, and being very um, like stale, I guess you would say. And people, and the hard part for me was people would come up to me and be like, okay, so why aren't you leading worship anymore? I really was, you know, digging that. I was really ex ex loving what was happening when you were leading worship. And I didn't know. I didn't know why I wasn't leading worship anymore. And I was too young to know really how to ask. 
about it or what to do about it. So at the same time, Katy Perry, um, who was Kate Hudson or Katie Hudson or something like that at the time, she decided to um, kind of change her tra trajectory of Christian music and kind of became popular with the song I Kissed a Girl and I Liked It. And, you know, she went off the charts and she went a different way. Um, even though we, we had, you know, I don't even know if I was singing, but we, we had these events at my church where we would, you know, do these performances, invite all the teens in the area, and we'd all come, and they were, I thought they were cool, I don't know if they, <laughs> they were really cool, but um, anyway, so we would do that, and she was, you know, I remember her being at one of them, and later on in life, I was like, oh my gosh, that was, like, I just connected those two, that those are the same people, so she went a different way, and she chose a different path, right, whereas I felt like God was calling me to, um, to keep pursuing being, you know, involved in worship, and um, and so, I mean, at that time, somewhere in that time also, I went to this really big conference, and uh, there's a guy who's a prophetic worship leader, and his name is Don Potter. I don't know if anybody's heard of him, but um, he, he um, even he laid his hands over me and prayed over me and, and told me that I had a gift of prophetic worship. And I was like, this is my path. I know this is what I should do. And um, it was interesting because because at that time, also, I decided to go back to um back on the missions field, but this time I decided to do a school of worship and ministry. And it was in Spain, and um, it ended up probably being one of the most difficult seasons of my life because it was very hard to be in another country when I thought I spoke Spanish really well, but I didn't. Um, yeah, so, uh, but the thing was is that my church was the one who was supposed to send me off. They were the ones who were like believing in me and being like, yes, Elisa, we believe in you. Whereas at the same time, I was having a struggle because because all of a sudden I wasn't leading worship. And then one day, get this, my pastor um, was like, we're going to have a, a gospel choir come and lead worship now at our church. Okay, so we're, we're from Southern California. There, there are no gospel choirs here. I mean, and we were not like, we weren't from, you know, the inner city. We were just like, oh, I mean, a lot, some of us were PCY. There was a lot of Mexicans. You know, there was, I was just... But he was from the South, and he liked gospel music, and so he's like, I'm going to hire this church to bring in their gospel choir. And that made it even worse, because then he's paying the money to come in and sing gospel music for us. And our church had never done anything like that, so everybody was like, well, well what? what is going on? This is so not like the culture of our church. And I was really, really, really hurt by it, um, because, you know, I felt like they were behind me, and then all of a sudden, they were not behind me. And especially him, and I didn't know why. Um, and so, as you can see, um, obviously, I kind of had some issues. So at one point, I, um, I finally, somebody was like, you need to talk to him, like actually talk to him. And I didn't know how to talk to him, so I wrote him a really long letter, and he said, I'm going to read it. And, and then he was supposed to have like this meeting with me and like the elders of the church or something to like send me off. And at that meeting, I was like, so you, or right before that meeting, I was like, you read the letter, right? What do you think? Can we talk about it? And he was like, actually, I didn't read it really, you know. And I just was really crushed by him because I was like, I don't believe you're sending me off at all. You don't believe in this part of me. This is not, you know, and I was really hurt and broken by it. And at the same time, I had all the people at that church being like, what went down with you? And then I'm like, I don't know. So the result was I went to a school of worship really, really broken because I felt like God had called me to be involved in worship and worship leading. And, um, but before that, I was really hurt by my church, who were the ones who were supposed to be like equipping me. And you know, if it was one thing that I was really that bad at music, then I wish he had a conversation with me about that. But I don't think that was the issue, because otherwise, they wouldn't have given me the job in the first place. Um, and that wouldn't have been the feedback that I had gotten from anybody. So the point is, is that um, I had a lot of pain and hurt from that. Okay, so going back to the story of Herodias, if you can, if you want to, you can open your Bible to uh, Mark 6, 14 through 29. I'll read it to you. Um, I think this is the New Living Translation that I have. Okay, so Herod and Tapas, I'm, I'm going to screw up some of these names, and that's okay. Um, the king, he soon heard about Jesus because everyone was talking about him. Some were saying, this must be John the Baptist raised from the dead. That's why he can do such miracles. Others said, he's the prophet Elijah. And still others said, he's a prophet like the other great prophets of the past. When Herod heard about Jesus, he said, John, the man I beheaded had come back from the dead. So he, he's pretty sure that Jesus is a ghost. 
Um, so Herod, so this is the story. Why did he think that he was a ghost? Well, John was dead, and this is why. For Herod had sent his soldiers to arrest and imprison John as a favor to Herodias. So here's our, our villain of the story. She had been the brother of Philip's wife, but Herod had married her. John had been telling Herod, it's against God's law for you to marry your brother's wife. So Herodias bore a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. But without Herod's approval, she was powerless. For Herod had respected John, and knowing that he was a good and holy man, he protected him. Herod was greatly disturbed whenever he talked to John, but even so, he still liked to listen to him. Herodias' chance finally came on Herod's birthday. He gave a party for his high government officials, army officers, and leading citizens of Galilee. Then his daughter, also named Herodias, okay, I'm going to pause right there. Um, according to history, they call her Salome, um, and she was actually his adopted daughter. He wasn't really, she was not his biological daughter. Um, so she came and performed a dance that greatly pleased Herod and his guests. Ask me anything you like, the king said to the girl, and I will give it to you. He even vowed, I'll give you whatever you ask, even up to half my kingdom. She went out and asked her mother, what should I ask for? Her mother said, ask for the head of John the Baptist. In other passages, it says on a silver platter. So the girl hurried back to the king and told him, I want the head of John the Baptist right now on a trip. The king deeply regretted what he had said, but because the vows he had made in front of his guests, he could not refuse her. So immediately he sent an executioner to the prison to cut off John's head and bring it to him. The soldier beheaded John in the prison and brought his head on the tray and gave it to the girl who took it to her mother. That's a lot of passing head drawn. Um, so when John's disciples heard what had happened, they came to get his body and buried him. Okay, so this is a story that's slightly morbid. Um, and that's one of the interesting things about the Bible is there are quite a few morbid stories in it. And this is one of the ones where you're like, oh, okay, what, what is the purpose of this in here? And I don't really know if what I'm going to talk about is the purpose that it is in here, but it is a good example of um, unforgiveness and bitterness. Because the reason John the Baptist got, you know, his head chopped off was because, because there was a woman who hated him because of an offense. She hated him so much she had him murdered. She hated him so much, she passed that offense down to her daughter. Okay, so there's different interpretations of people, you know, trying to figure out what went down. Lots of people think um, Salome, she could have been just this little girl performing a cute dance. Other people think she was like, like full scale, nude, naked dancing, and really just, it was like a pornographic type of thing. And I don't have a clue. I don't really know, but we do know this is that the king would give half the kingdom to her. Okay, so she has this choice of a future that she can have. She doesn't necessarily realize she has this choice, but at this moment, she has a choice. She has a choice to either, you know, take what her mom, her mom's grudge that her mom gives her, because she goes up to her mom and says, hey, what should, I, what should I do with this offer? And her mom says, bring out my vengeance, you know? But... She didn't have to choose that, right? I mean, maybe, now let's pretend she's a little bit older, old enough to make this decision. Maybe she is, you know, like a skanky dancer. Um, and maybe that's what, you know, she has the ability to make these decisions. I mean, if she's like a five-year-old cute little girl, then that, you know, then she's gonna do what her mom tells you, tells her. But uh, for the sake of this analogy, let's, let's say that she has the ability to choose the outcome that she wants. And she chooses the outcome of vengeance. That bitterness that Herodias had against John the Baptist, because essentially John the Baptist called them out and was like, hey, you guys are the leaders of the land. You should not be divorcing each other's, you know, because they were both married. You shouldn't be divorcing each other and, and hooking up and doing this thing. It's kind of wrong. And so I don't know why John decided to say that. I, that's kind of irrelevant. Maybe God told him to. Regardless, it ended up John with the relationship where he would actually talk with Herod on a regular basis to an extent, at least enough so that, I mean, it says that, that uh, Herod was greatly disturbed whenever he talked with John. So you know they had some sort of conversation, right? Um, and I don't know why God allowed him in that prison and allowed him to have that relationship with Herod before he died, but he did. But the thing is, is that, is that you have this other person, Herodias, who has this anger and bitterness 
so that when she has the opportunity to coach her daughter to do something amazing with her life, she has half the kingdom at her disposal. She coaches her to, to murder somebody, right? That's kind of that's kind of wrong, right? So that's the kingdom that Salome chose. I don't know if she chose it on purpose, like I said, but that's the one that she had. And um, and I guess my point with this is like is this is that unforgiveness sometimes stays with us, right? But sometimes unforgiveness comes from people above us, from our family, from our parents. Um, lots of times the insecurities that we have that, you know, when our parents or, or people who are taking care of us when we're saying things to us, it's really their own issues and their own baggage that they're dumping on us. And then they give it to us. And then we have it our whole lives unless we figure out how to break away from it. Or, or what about our political views? A lot of our political views come from our families, right? Our families of origin. Um, racism. That comes from our culture that's passed down to us from our parents. I remember sitting um, and I was in a small group and some guy was saying the most, I mean, just, it was the whole time he was just racism, 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 like extreme type of stuff where you just want to gag. And you're like, I can't believe this guy's out. Our Bible study and says he's a Christian. And I just, I did not know how to deal with it. I was not equipped to deal with it. But you know, it turned out that that was how he was raised. Doesn't make it right, but he had that anger at a certain people group, like an extreme hatred towards that people group that was that was that kingdom of Herodias that was passed on to him, and he took it. So this is kind of where I'm going, is that today God gives us another chance. He gives us a different opportunity. He says, you don't have to take the kingdom of Herodias, the kingdom of, un of bitterness, of hate, of, of jealousy, you have the opportunity to take the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is everything except for that, right? The kingdom of God is love. The kingdom of God is forgiveness. The kingdom of God is healing. The kingdom of God is surrender. The kingdom of God is beautiful is what it is. Amen. I mean, the idea of the kingdom of God is that, is that we take, we take the, the low and bring them high. And we take the high and we bring them to a place where they can unify. But if you are in the kingdom of Herodias, you're not creating unity. You're not trying to reconcile your differences. You're destroying life. Right. You're passing that down to your kid. Mm -hmm. And that is not, that's not, that's not what we want, right? That's not who we are. That's not what God designed for us if we are followers of Jesus. So um, unforgiveness is kind of, this is the example I use, and it's probably not the best example, but I really like it, so I'm going to show it to you. Um, Megan, can you give me a pin? Um, one of these pins. I have, I have, I have a few because I'm not sure which one would work. Well, maybe the other one. Cut that one side. Sure. Okay, so um, she handed me a pin. This is the offense that Megan gave me. Um, so she did something terrible. Sorry, you did something terrible. Okay. <laughs> so she did something terrible to me. She uh, slipped the tires on my car. She didn't really slip the tires on my car, just so you know. But I'm going to pretend that's what she did. Okay, so she did that, and I have this offense. So she dropped it in my lap, right? Okay, so I have this offense in my hands, and, you know, I'm like, this, that was unjust. That was wrong. That was hurtful. You know, however I decide to process it. So, but the thing is, is that the pin is not, it's not just a, a pin, but it's like an open pin. And as I hold it, and, I, and I'm, like, using it, it's getting all over me, right? You, you guys can see that. It. Yeah, and I'm like thinking, and then I forget that I hold it, it's in my pocket, and then it's like getting all over my clothing, and now it's all over my arm, it's going to get on my face, you know, it's like attacking me, right? And if, you know, if I keep holding it, what if I talk about it all the time, if I talk about it all the time, I'm going to start ingesting it, and it's going to be this poison inside of me. I would like to get really dramatic and say, it's going to be my blood, the ink of the pit, you know, but I mean, <laughs> I'm all stuck the analogy at that point. But the point is, is that the more you fondle that, that thing that was given to you, right, it becomes, it, it gets on you, it covers you. So is it affecting Megan at all? No, she's dropped it in my lap. It's out of, you know, it has nothing to do with her. It's beyond her. It, like the only reason she would ever like think about it again is because she sees me either covered in ink and is like, why are you covered with ink? And I'll be like, oh yeah. Remember those tires you slit? Um, but, or, you know, on the other hand, um, I could throw it back at her, 
you know, um, I would try it, except for I'd probably miss, and then I would hit the camera, and then that would. Um, but the point is, is that if you have something that's given to you that hurts you, the longer you hold it, the more that ink gets on you. And some of us have been holding things since childhood. That ink is all over us. It hurts us. It is not what is designed for you, though. That is the kingdom of Herodias, the kingdom of offense. And you can pass that on if you're not careful because it will affect your actions and it will affect what you teach your children. It will affect the people around you. But instead, you have the choice to do some other option and say, this doesn't even hurt Megan. I don't want it to hurt me either. And so you let go of it. Although, on the other hand, like I say that as if it's an easy thing, it is not an easy thing to let go of a fence. Dropping a pin, I just like tell my muscles to move my hand and it drops. But when you've been holding an offense, it does not drop easily. So, like, I know that, um, you know, like, we can have, like, with Herodias, she, she wanted to murder, right? Okay, so there's this verse in Colossians 3, 8, it says, Once the way you behaved, it was characterized by your evil deeds, but now it's time to eliminate them from your lives once and all. Anger, fits of rage, all forms of hatred. And in Colossians, it keeps going, it's talking about these things that are, that are of the old kingdom. Not who we are right now, not who we're supposed to be as children of God. So we have this thing, we don't want the anger. We don't want to carry that oppression and that injustice that we might have been passed on. Like, you know, we don't want to keep going back to the example of racism. We don't want to perpetuate that, right? Or jealousy, that's another sign that we have unforgiveness. Um, so like going back here, I'll read you this first. You want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. You're jealous of what others have but you can't get it, so you fight and wage war to take it away from them. That's in James 4.12. Um, and like for me, when I go to the offense that I had with my pastor at my old church, um, that I was, I don't think I even realized, I mean, I knew that I had some problems and I knew I had some unresolved stuff. And the whole time I was doing the mission stuff and um, pursuing uh, and teaching on worship and learning about worship and um, you know, going into all the Greek and Hebrew words about worship, I could, if you wanted me to, I could preach a sermon on that, which would be really weird. But, like, I, I knew that stuff because I lived it. You know, I did that school. But the thing is, is that, is that even though I was doing that school, it was so, I was just so bagged down or bogged down with that, that hurt. And I knew I was hurt. And I talked with, like, so many of the leaders that came and spoke at that school. I was like, I've got this problem, and I don't know how to get rid of it. And I worked through it a little bit. I prayed. I, you know, they, you know, I let go of some of it, but they never entirely left me. Uh, parts of it did, but I think it was a huge process I had to go through, and it would rise up. And usually, I would know it was rising up because I would start feeling jealous. So when I heard that Katy Perry made it big, I was jealous. You know, I was like, "What? How did you become?" I was like, "Well, you." God and everybody else, but you know, like, you know, I, my initial reaction was jealousy, or you know, I couldn't go to church services for many years without feeling jealous of whoever was singing on stage. It wasn't that that opportunity wasn't available to me, like, I could have tried out for the worship team, and at one point I did, and eventually I joined one of them, but you know, it was more of the aspect of like, like, I could see that I was jealous. And I knew that that was a sign of something unhealthy inside of me. And because there was that unhealthiness inside of me, I didn't think that I was qualified, because I probably wasn't, at a right heart space to lead other people in worship when that jealousy and that anger was still inside of me. Um, and so as, you know, as I keep going on talking about this, I had this pin, and what I was kind of doing with it is I would kind of like drop it for a little bit and kind of pick it up or kind of drop it a little bit and pick it up. And I think that that's kind of what happens a lot of times with forgiveness, and that's part of the process of letting things go, is that we have to, like, we give it to God, and then as soon as we're triggered by it again, we're kind of like, oh, yeah, that pin is familiar to me. You know, like, I don't think I was fully free. Um, but God, you know, in all of his goodness, he wanted me to become fully free because he doesn't like us to be oppressed. He doesn't want us to live in the kingdom of Herodias, carrying offenses, and passing that down, you know, like, because you know how easy that would be to pass down? Like, like I already find myself catching myself because when people, you know, if, if I'm coaching somebody who wants to join a worship team, I'm going to have to be like, eh, they will hurt you, you know, because it's coming out of my own hurt. And it might be true. 
they might hurt them. Maybe that warning is a good warning, but it really, but I have, I have to be very careful with my words, right? Because I'm leading other people who have a vision or a calling. You know, let's say my daughter, she wants to, she, actually, this is, this is a perfect example. My daughter would love to do worship, and she would love to lead worship. And I think part of me is somewhat hesitant because of my experiences with that, that I want to be like, okay, let's try it carefully. Let's go slowly, you know, and I could be passing on that kingdom of Herodias or my own offense to her if I'm not careful and I could be holding her back. Instead, I should be like, baby, half the kingdom is yours. The kingdom of God is for you. You are a daughter of God. You have a purpose. You have a calling. You go for it. Whatever God is calling you to, he will be with you and he will guide you along the way. But that's not what I'm giving her all the time. But that's what we, we have. We can do, right? If we're not going to be the Herodiases in the world. Um, so going back to my story, I know that God wanted me free. And so at one point, uh, it was right before I moved here. It was in 2015, which is right after Katy Perry sang in the Super Bowl halftime show. Um, the worship leader at our church asked me to join the worship team. And I was like, oh, I, I still have a lot of hurt associated with this. I mean, I know I've tried to work through it. I've done all the right things. I've checked the boxes. But I'm not sure I'm ready. And he was like, I think you should do it. And my husband was like, yeah, it's probably time. And I'm like, it is time. I need to get over this. And I knew that part of it for getting over it for me would be actually like leading worship again, right? Um, and so, it was, it, so I was like, I'm going to do this. And the first week went great. I sang in harmony beautifully. Like, it was a really good worship set. Like, we, we, and we were God well, so musically it was good. Um, and then, you know, from another standpoint, it was good too, you know, because we were actually worshiping God. But the next week, so I was like, I was feeling pretty pumped up after that. I was like, okay, I'm back in the game. We're good. And then the next week, this is what happens. This, I just, I just, so like crazy still. Okay, so I'm sitting there, and I'm like standing there, and I'm supposed to sing the solo for the Easter service. And um, and I'm a little scared because I don't like to sing solos at all. Like I like to be, you know, a harmony singer or whatever. Um, and <laughs> I'm supposed to sing this the solo, but I'm like trying to like brave up. I'm like, okay, I can do this. This is where God wants me. I'm gonna do this. I'm, I'm gonna get back into worship. And this girl walks in the room, and she's gorgeous. I mean, she's like, she's, you know, she was early 20s. I mean, drop dead gorgeous, beautiful. Um, and she climbs up on stage. And I'm like, who are you? You know, and she's like, oh, Will, who's our pastor, he knows me from some other thing. And he said, hey, we need new musicians because there's not a lot at this, you know, at the church. So you might as well come. And like, because you have a really good voice, so you can sing with us. And I was thinking, I'm like, oh my gosh, it's happening all, you know, like, like my pastor is inviting some random chick to come and take over worship again. And so, like, since I have the solo, I'm starting to sing this song. And I'm, like I said, I'm not the greatest soloist. And I'm shaking, and it's my first time singing it. And then they're like, and, and you know, they're like, oh, let me try it too. She sings it, and she sings it like a boss. Like, I mean, she was incredible. And then she's like, yeah, I have perfect pitch. And I just wanted to look <laughs> And I was like, I was like, you can't really, like, I thought she was just talking it up. But she was like, she, she literally had perfect pitch. And I was like, oh my gosh, why God? Like, all I'm thinking is like, why God, why God, why God? And all the people in the band are kind of like, she, she can sing the solo if she wants to because they don't want to be mean to me. But they, but she was doing way better than I was. And I'm just like, you know, trying to like get through it. And then like, you know, when she leaves practice, like the other guys in the room are like, wow. Because <clears throat> I mean, because that was like, like one of them actually was like, wow, she's the whole package. And I wanted to just like shoot him, you know? Like, and, and, then, um, and then I was just, I was kind of like, you know, done with it. It turned out, I thought that she was also going to Berkeley School of Music. Um, it turned out she was going to um, Berkeley School of Music, but for management and online. So it wasn't the exact same. But still, I was like, you know, she was, uh, I was, and I was just so angry. And I came up to God, um, you know, and I'm like in my car, like pounding my fist. I'm like, God, I just said yes to this. And getting back into this, I'm like, I can't do this. And like the same thing is happening over again. Like what? And I'm accusing God. I'm like, why would you send her? Why would you let her 
enter that building. Why would you have her there? And I am so angry. And well, it's, oh gosh, it still makes me so mad. And so, like, so like, and, and you know what God said to me? I really like, it was very like clear. And sometimes, you know, you kind of like think God is directing you in some way. And sometimes you know God is directing you in some way. And this was one of those moments where God was just like, baby, I want you to be free. Because he was not satisfied with what I was satisfied with. I was satisfied with being broken. And he was, satis he was not satisfied with that. He wanted something better for me. Yeah. He wanted me to be free, all the way free. And he yeah. was like, you know what? You're not going to get all the way free until I drop that trigger in your lap mm. and say, boom, yes. you got to deal with this girl. Amen. I mean, I don't think God usually calls me girl, but you know, maybe he does sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but it was kind of one of those things that I was like, like I had this, you know, picture in my mind of like this, this, this bird in a cage that was like circling around, and and the door was open and the bird just took off. And he's like, that's what I want you to be in this. I don't want you to be held back any longer. And you know, I gave you a week where you sang great and you were beautiful and it was wonderful. Yeah. Now you get to deal with the real stuff. And I was like, why is this so quick? Because I was thinking that was also right when we were moving here. Mm -hmm. And so we had just found out we were moving. We had like five weeks left to pack our house move across the country. It was like extreme. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, my husband's like moving things out and I'm still like leading like mentorship circle in my house, you know? And he's like, why are there people still here? I'm like, I'm not done discipling them. Don't kick them out yet. And he was like, we're leaving. You need to shut this down, you know? And I'm like, this is not a good time. Like Elijah was a baby. Like it was just, I was like overwhelmed. I'm like, this is not a good time for healing, God. I need you to do this another time. And he's like, no, 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 no. This is a good time for healing because, because we want you to be healed. Like there's no point in you waiting until you get to 